what is it like using Bayesian tools when you're a software engineer or a computer scientist? How do you apply these tools in the online ad industry? More generally, what is Bayesian thinking philosophically? And is it really useful in everyday life? Because, well, you can fire up MCMC each time you need to make a quick decision under uncertainty. So how do you do that in practice when you have at most a pen and paper? In this episode, you'll hear Max Clark's take on these questions. Max is a software engineer with a focus on machine learning and Bayesian inference. Now working at Foursquare's Innovation Lab, he recently led the development of a causality model for Foursquare's ad attribution product and taught a course on Bayesian things at the Elviv Data Science Summer School. Max is also an open source enthusiast and a fellow podcaster. He's the host of the Local Maximum podcast, where you can hear every week about the latest trends in AI, machine learning, and technology from an engineering perspective. Oh, and if you like the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix, well, you're in for a treat at the end of the episode. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics. Episode 8, recording December 5, 2019. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the project, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbasestats.anvil.app. That's learnbasestats.anvil.app. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Wes Bayesian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching. I'm hey, folks. Just a quick note before the show, I'd like to do two or three special episodes per year uh, with guests not directly from the Bayesian world, but still related to science and or uh, programming, of course. I thought this could be a good way to expand our perspective and be inspired by what's going on elsewhere. And the nice thing is you'll be able to send me questions to ask the guests directly for you. My first guest for this experiment will be Michael Kennedy, the creator of Talk Python Training, the host of the most popular Python podcast and a cornerstone of the Python world. Michael is a very knowledgeable and respected member of the community, so I'm very happy to share his thoughts with you on Python's rise and future, on its role in science and research, and any other nerdy questions you have in mind. So you have until February 19 to send me all your questions via Twitter, email, or any other means you fancy. I really can't wait to see what you thought about. Okay, on to the show now. Max Clara, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thanks, Alex. Really great to be here. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. It's great having a fellow podcaster on the show. You're the first one, so I'm really glad to have you on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, it's fun today. You know, seven hours of coding and one hour of podcasting. That's a good day. It's better than eight hours of coding. So <laughs> we're all good. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Actually, I had the exact same day. I'm in Paris, so I'm ahead of you in my day, but I did exactly what you just said. <laughs> so it's quite nice. So maybe we can start because I said in the introduction that uh, you're hosting a nice podcast show, The Local Maximum, but I thought it would be best that you gave the elevator pitch for the show. Sure. Well, you know, The Local Maximum is a weekly podcast, and it's kind of a variety tech news machine learning show. I do a number of things on it. I bring on guests. I talk about the latest news with my co-host, and sometimes I bring on concepts from machine learning, from statistics and probability, from product development, from Bayesian inference, of course. In fact, my first episodes are on Bayesian inference. I, I bring that in a lot. I try to make it relevant to people in their everyday lives. I've used these things to actually solve real world problems. I've used them to build products. But I think that a lot of these principles are actually relevant to like solving everyday problems as well. And so I want to make it like, you know, relevant to people who are, you know, maybe interested in tech, but uh, not necessarily machine learning engineers themselves. 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. I like that about your show. I listen to it every week and uh, <laughs> awesome. yeah, I like it. Uh, yeah, congrats on this. Yeah, and then sometimes, sometimes I throw the listeners for, through a loop. Sometimes I do something that's completely different from what I've done before. And, you know, some people say maybe you should have a little consistency in your podcast, give the audience what they're expecting. But honestly, if I'm going to do a podcast every week, in addition to my job, and I want to talk about something, and then I say, well, no, I can't do that. That breaks the rules of my podcast. Well, then come on, what's the point of podcasting? No, uh, exactly. That's true. I always find that kind of funny when you do solo episodes like that. It's interesting. I'm like, wow, that's a performance to like, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Speak, speak solo this, for 40 minutes. I don't know. Have you done a solo show yet on your show? Yeah, uh, yeah, but just the first one, which was uh, an introductory show. Yeah, it's a very interesting experience. I'll tell you about that. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a lot different. Like, if I'm talking to someone else, I prepare questions. It kind of flows. With the solo shows, you really have to almost write a script. There's no one there to like jog your memory and, and to keep things flowing. And uh, I find it nerve wracking, even though I can always stop and re-record. No, but that's true. It's really, you have to have like kind of word by word script and you have to be careful not to give the impression too much that you're reading the script, even though you're kind of reading it. It's a completely other uh, thing to do. But congrats on this podcast. You launched it like uh, one year and a half ago, something like that? Yeah, almost two years ago in February 2018. Okay, great. Just for uh, my audience, a little note is that you're on the show because you are an adept of Bayesian thinking. And uh, even though your show is quite diverse, uh, you always uh, sprinkle some Bayesian references in your episodes. That's what I like to. It's kind of the idea that you apply Bayesian thinking to everyday life topics. So yeah, just so that my audience know, it's quite different from what I do here, where I go into the weeds uh, with the guests and we often talk about the guts of models and distributions and stuff like that. Your podcast is, as you said, a lot more applied on how to think like a Bayesian on advertisement or politics or stuff like that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's good stuff. I like it. And so to get into your Bayesian thinking, so I as I mentioned, you're an adept of Bayesian thinking. And um, do you remember when and how you first got introduced to it? Yeah, so I don't remember exactly. I mean, I'm sure it's possible. I probably saw Bayes rules sometime in high school. I'm almost certain I saw it as an undergrad in college. But I really started to dig deeper into it when I was in grad school. You know, my first few jobs out of college as an undergrad, I worked here in New York City as a software engineer. I was doing web work. I was doing back-end work. I wasn't particularly inspired by my job. So <laughs> I, what did I do? I didn't know what to do. So I took the money that I had made from my jobs and I went back to school. I went to business school. Well, it was half business school. The joke I made was I didn't know what to do, so I went to business school. But no, it wasn't really business school. It was information systems, so it was half computer science and half business. And the reason I didn't do all computer science is because that's why I did that as an undergrad. So, you know, I needed to branch out a little bit. But I really started to get into machine learning, natural language processing, all that stuff as, wow, these are the types of problems that I want to work on that are much more interesting than the kind of stuff that uh, I had been working on professionally before. And I really started to think deeply about it when I was, you know, in school trying to learn about how do you get a machine to learn? How do you get a machine to generalize data? And as I worked back into some of the theory, I really felt there are a lot of different kind of theoretical underpinnings of machine learning. But the one that grabbed me as the most significant was Bayesian inference, the idea that you have some model of the world, and then you get some data, and then you update your model of the world. There's a blog post that I have when I worked at EdLab. I was an intern at Columbia in 2010, and I wrote a few blog posts about it at the time. But that was really around the time when I was starting to think about it much more deeply. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because usually most of the guests don't have a proper training. It's not like they have a bachelor or master's of Bayesian statistics. Well, because uh, most of the time Bayesian statistics is not the default that's taught in universities, in schools. Yeah, it's interesting. Like like my, my position is I have a lot of kind of theoretical understanding of it and conceptual understanding of it. And then I actually use it at work, but I would say I'm not so much an expert at like the different frameworks and languages 
and stuff that people use to implement Bayesian models. Yeah, actually, I say I've not really thought thoroughly about that, but I say this concept, Bayesian thinking and Bayes rule, is actually one of the quite rare concepts that are easier to understand conceptually than to really do day to day, you know, like doing Bayesian sampling and MCMC and so on is a really hard machinery that goes under their hood. While really understanding the principle of Bayes rule and why you would do that, why you would update your prior knowledge of any subject is really, really intuitive, I find. Yeah, yeah, it makes it a lot easier to explain what's going on to people. I mean, we, you know, one of the problems we had when we were dealing with attribution, which was Foursquare's products for measuring the effectiveness of ads, it's a very complicated product. And there's all these jobs and data migrations and stuff that go into it. And it's like, well, why are we making this prediction? What does this mean? Whenever we put the explanation in the form of Bayes' rule, even though, you know, executives, well, some of them certainly know Bayes rule, but like not everybody in the company we had to explain what was going on knows Bayes rule. Not everyone in sales knows, knows this stuff. We always said, well, okay, you know, we have a prior and then the data is coming in and now we're getting more and more certain as to what the answer is as time goes on because we have more data. Like people kind of intuitively understand that. At least I found it was <laughs> better than the way we were explaining it before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like democracy is the worst form of government except for every other that's been tried it's a similar way. It's when you try to explain the statistical model to lay people. It's like Bayes rule is the way to go. Sometimes it's still hard, but if you try anything else, it's uh, if you try p-values, oh my God, it's, it's going to be insane. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a lot harder. And actually, if you had to sum up these methods to someone, to lay people, as you said, what would be the main asset of Bayesian methods in your mind? I think you need to have a few things in order to apply Bayes rule. And you could either have these things, you know, exactly, or there's kind of like the back of the envelope calculation, which works as well, which where you don't have it exactly. But here it goes. I think the first thing you need is a problem where you're trying to figure out some explanation of something. You're trying to decide between a bunch of mutually exclusive hypotheses as to, you know, what is going on in a certain situation. Those hypotheses could be, I mean, in the ad case, it's what's the lift value of the ad? What's the effectiveness of the ad? In episode one of my podcast, we used the case where a mistake was made by the government in Hawaii, the state government, and you know everyone got a text saying that uh, there's an ICBM missile coming this way. And so the question is, okay, your two hypotheses are there is a missile coming or there is not a missile coming. And so basically, you just have to have that set of hypotheses. And sometimes that's the most interesting part of setting up the problem is coming up with what is my hypothesis space? There are simple ones, there are complex ones, and sometimes just doing that exercise actually gets you insight in a problem that you wouldn't otherwise have. Then what you need is some data as to what you're seeing right now. And then you can sort of say, well, what you would expect to see based on each of the hypotheses. So sort of like that's kind of the likelihood part of your equation. Well, let's start with the prior part of the equation, right? So the prior part of the equation is how likely do you think each hypothesis is in relation to each other? So you come up with some probability distribution over those. And then you sort of figure out the likelihood, which is the second term in Bayes' rule, which is how likely is the data we're seeing, the information we're seeing, given that each hypothesis is true. So you kind of score them that way. And then in the end, you just multiply those together. And that's essentially your score for how likely each hypothesis is in the posterior. It's the unnormalized posterior. So it's really just multiplying two numbers together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except when you have to compute the denominator, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it's bad. But sometimes you usually have to. But uh, sometimes you are only looking for like, what's the relative probability of this hypothesis versus this hypothesis, so H1 versus H2, in which case you could do it pretty easily. Then, you know, yes, then when you actually want to search the space, if it's a complicated space, then you need, like you said, MCMC or some other method like that, you know, hill climbing or the interesting one that I had in episode four, I believe, of the local maximum, I was building some kind of playing around with my co-host. I built some code that solves the substitution cipher, which is every letter in the alphabet is transposed into a different letter in the alphabet. There's a permutation there. And then so you start at a certain point and you kind of flip letters until the jumble of letters that you get looks more and more like English. And so for your likelihood, you have some language model. So that's more like, you know, just hill climbing, just kind of moving around in the space, trying to find something that's better and better. But it all comes down to just figuring out what are the relative likelihood between two hypotheses in your space. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, I think that um, one of the whole points of MCMC methods is to compute the posterior, so basically base rules, without having to compute the ugly integral in, on the denominator, which is called the marginal likelihood. So then you have to just look at the relative proportions, as you said, on the numerator. It's a, a very neat trick. Each time I'm reading about MCMC, I'm like, oh yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, there's still a lot of active research in making that converge much faster. I don't understand kind of the latest and greatest samplers, but uh, they've gotten really good. And then when you kind of do the back of the envelope calculation, coming back kind of on your day to day sort of decisions, oftentimes you're only dealing with like a smaller discrete set of hypotheses, in which case, you know, it, it actually gets a lot easier. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And I'm also wondering, because here we talked about the main asset of Bayesian methods, what is the main problem of Bayesian methods in your mind? So number one, I think that there is still a lot of momentum from the kind of frequentist method that you kind of find all over the place where they're not really ready to switch to Bayesian. A good example of that would be in advertising and measuring ads. When people sit down and try to come up with the best solutions, they often come up with Bayesian solutions, but marketers and stuff are still using those p-values and it's hard to get people to change from that. But engineers and people in the machine learning world are often been very open to using Bayes rule. I think that occasionally there's still a bunch of work to do on some of the tooling around it. You know, many of the machine learning libraries out there, they're kind of based on Bayesian inference deep down, but they don't really show it. They're not really kind of built for that sort of interpretation, but that's okay. I have found Bayesian thinking in particular, not any one framework, to be really helped in solving problems in my work. Oh, yeah, okay. And actually, that's a nice transition to my next question, because I was wondering, uh, it's interesting because you're uh, really from a computer science background. And actually, I want to get back to that later, but you're from a computer science background and you work in industry. So I'm wondering how widespread are Bayesian methods in your line of work? For people who are machine learning engineers and who are building statistical software, I find almost universal acceptance of Bayesian inference and Bayesian thinking as a good way to do things, a good way to organize things. And when we take one problem and put it into the Bayesian framework, I've found in my work and the people I work with, you know, a lot of engineers and data scientists really appreciate that. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. And actually, let's go back to your uh, background a little before going further, because that's related to what you just said. Uh, if I understood correctly, you come from a computer science and software engineering background, and yet uh, you work a lot on statistical topics and machine learning topics. So how come? What's the story here? Yeah, I could go back to basically that story that I told you about grad school when I found that I was studying data mining, or well, because that, that was the first class that I took that was actually in the business school, and then machine learning and then natural language processing. The reason why I was so enthralled or I guess inspired by taking those courses is that to me, they were a lot more interesting in that they were open-ended problems where you're kind of trying to take a problem and fit it into a probabilistic framework versus a deterministic framework and then coming up with solutions that way. That was just really interesting to me because I feel like that's the way that people end up making good decisions. And then that's the way we could end up having our machines make good decisions or give us good answers or good results or, or whatever. I mean, that seemed to be kind of the forefront of you know making the magic happen, so to speak. Yeah. So I was inspired by that. And then when I found Foursquare uh, back in 2011, they were building a recommendation engine for restaurants and points of interest. I had some experience in that field already. I had a website called Sticky Map, which was sort of my senior project as an undergrad, which was like when the Google Maps API came out, I sort of had people post little icons all over the map, leave messages and stuff. And then when I worked at uh, Yodel, I was working a little bit on local search engine. So I had some experience in that, but Foursquare kind of brought that all together where it was, you know, hey, we can actually build real machine learning models to analyze all these points of interest, try to figure out which are better and which are worth recommending, taking all this text that people are writing at different places and analyzing the text in a bunch of different languages. So that allowed me to dive into a lot of these problems in a real world setting. 
And what proportion of the time actually do you use uh, Bayesian methods in these activities? If I'm working on a machine learning or a statistical problem, I pretty much use kind of a Bayesian framework all the time. I kind of lay it out. Okay, these are my different, this is my hypothesis space, and this is my prior, and this is the data we have, and this is what we're trying to solve. Now, I'm not always working on these types of problems. Sometimes, like right now, uh, for example, I'm working in what we're calling kind of the four square innovation lab where we're trying to build new products that are in the location space that some of which will hit the market soon that use a lot of Foursquare technology that is developed on some of these principles, but not kind of developing it in a new way. It's more like, okay, trying to come up with kind of the first version of a method that will pick out content from different places when you're there. And so we have a bunch of highly worked on statistical models underneath the hood, but it's sort of just pick them because I know where they all are and sort of put them all together in sort of more of a haphazard way to try to get something into the market and start testing it versus actually sitting down and building the models like exactly. We're not like, you know, building new statistical models. We're kind of recombining them, repackaging them in, into products. Yeah, I see. And actually, do you have some favorite model or method that you used for work or open source that you want to share with listeners? Yeah. So one method that uh, I use for attribution, which worked really well, and I'm hoping to come out with like an academic paper on this soon. It's not like a brand new thing. Other papers mentioned it, but I don't think anyone's kind of laid it out in a very organized way yet is one of the things that we had to do is that we had so much data. Well, we wanted to figure out what's the probability that any given person or a specific person is going to visit a certain chain on a certain day. So we would say like you, Alexandra, this Friday, Starbucks, what's the probability, right? And we have lots of data on that. The problem is they were imbalanced. You know, we have a lots of examples of people who didn't visit Starbucks, but very few examples of people who did visit Starbucks. And when we had to sample down the data, well, the visit data, the days where people actually visit, that's really important data. I don't want to throw that out. I just want to throw out some of the negative examples. And so then the question is, well, how can you build a machine learning model where you've sampled the data unevenly. And so there's a lot of theory on that. What a lot of people just do is they just build the model and then try to readjust after. But the answer to that can actually put on sound Bayesian footing. You know, when you say, okay, here's my model space and here's my data. I already know that that data has been sampled and I know how that's been sampled. So I can come up with a set of equations to say, okay, here's my posterior given all that information that I have. And we kind of built that up from first principles. We did it in a general way. So you could do it with any Bayesian model and with any scheme of sampling. And there's a formula that comes out at the end and works beautifully. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. What's interesting about that problem is you kind of want to start to understand, and this might be like a future research thing, you kind of want to understand like which data is okay to throw away and which is okay to keep. I mean, I get the sense that the data that is in the class that is most common, if you're doing classification, you have one class that is so common, like it's 99% of the time, then yeah, maybe that's the least valuable data and you could throw that away. But there's got to be some way to understand, well, okay, I really care about these particular parameters. And so therefore, these are the data that I should look at more carefully. And this other data I could throw away, given that, you know, I have limited time and limited memory and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, clearly. That's very interesting. And actually, I guess you had some technical issues you encountered along the way for this project. I'm curious how you solved them. Yeah. So one of the technical issues that we were actually solving with that sampling thing was just it was so much data and lack of RAM and time and money and you know everything was so expensive. All that data engineering comes into it. Data engineering is one of the most important jobs in today's economy, in today's information economy, but it's not really my wheelhouse. It's a lot of like optimizing pipelines and things like that. And so I talk about it a little bit on the show, but those problems come up a lot. Another problem specific with attribution was more of just a problem of communication, just, uh, you know, interfacing between engineers and sales and the clients and more like, well, what does it mean if a campaign goes negative? You know, it doesn't mean that the ad is really pushing people away or, you know, it's a causality model is what it is. And so oftentimes in a causality model, there's no way to prove that there are no confounders that you're not measuring for. You can make certain assumptions and sort of see, okay, does this make sense? Maybe I feel like we have an important confounder that's missing, but 
but those can creep in. And that's a very tough communication problem where you could say, I think there's a confounder here. It could be these things, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> then people are like, ah, I don't think the stats team knows what they're talking about, but, but you know, they do. And then like eventually the, we've had a few people come in and out of the team and then they'll be like, let's put them on the problem. And they come up with the same solution as the people who had already been there. And then after a while, they're like, oh, okay, these guys maybe know what they're talking about. It's tough when the answer is, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. That's very tough. Already when you're uh, in research, but I mean, when you're in industry, I feel like it's even harder to say, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's hard when you're like put on the spot in a meeting. I find that when I talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, I talk to one of the executives one-on-one -on -one about some of the things that go negative and they're like, well, obviously, mathematically, you know, if we have a lot of, there are campaigns that don't work, right? There are campaigns, ad campaigns that don't have any effect. So mathematically, some of them are going to go a little positive. Some of them are going to go a little negative. Of course, that's true. But the problem is not everyone understands that. And if you're the client who is trying to measure the ad, then that becomes a lot more difficult. That's one of the problems with the industry is that when you're the engineering team, you want to put out the most accurate possible statement on whether the ads are working or not. But sometimes on the other end, there's someone who really has a stake in, no, these ads have to work and I have to prove it to someone. And it's hard to say, you know, then there's then a lot of pressure comes back to say, well, you know, can you run this a few different ways until it comes out positive? You know, that's like sacrifice religion to us. But that stuff happens. If there isn't someone who understands statistical inference there, or who thinks probabilistically, then people are going to start to do things that uh, have a negative effect on the accuracy of the results. Yeah, exactly. If you have to explain uh, confounding and causal inference and why it's different than uh, statistical methods, it's really hard. It's already really hard to understand that yourself. Yeah, there was a lot of debate just within the engineering team about what are the confounders? How do we think about this? Even before talking to people outside the technical team, it's not that easy. Then there's the question of, okay, which data points generalize to which other data points? Hey, like we have examples in the model that maybe aren't similar to the examples that we want, but then how do you figure out what should go in the model, what shouldn't? It's not obvious. One thing I like to say on the program, I like to talk about argument by analogy. Argument by analogy is good. Most of the things I think that we know in terms of like, you know, epistemology, like trying to figure out how do we know what we know is true. I think there's the mathematical world, there's a logical world where you kind of prove things. But I think in the real world, in science, argument by analogy is really the only way to get at the truth. But the problem is there's a lot of false analogies. So now you're arguing between well, what's a good analogy, what's a bad analogy, and then you're making analogies on analogies. Well, this analogy is good because it's a lot like this other analogy that worked before. <laughs> and then at some point, it's basically just building up experience is what it is. <laughs> That's true. In the end, it becomes uh, very meta if you build on analogies and analogies. Exactly. And to bring it back to something that's more concrete, like doing marketing, it's like, okay, if I target an ad at someone in the one city, is it going to have a similar effect if I target an ad to someone who is similar in another city? Yeah. And well, they're probably related. It depends on the situation. But then it's like, okay, what if we change the ages and the genders? In which cases can we generalize? In which cases can we not generalize? And you could build a model on that. You could build a model on all of that. But at some point, you have to stop modeling things because it gets too complicated. Yeah, yeah. Plus, if you're interested in causal inference, the model can tell you everything. It can tell you if your uh, causal model uh, is right. I mean, that depends on scientific background knowledge that is not in the model. Yeah. The good news is though, every once in a while, you get some really good results from these models where you kind of can find certain sub-segments of the population that convert really well on the ads, or you can find a certain segment that is not working on the ads. And it makes sense because you could sometimes find an explanation for that. I mean, that's why this is big business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But you know, I, I worked on that for a couple of years and two and a half years now. That was enough for me to work on that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, to stay in a concrete topic. Uh, I'm wondering what's your favorite technical stack when uh, working on this type of stuff and on Bayesian stuff particularly? Yeah, so it's interesting. Here at Foursquare, we mostly use Scala 
on the back end. And Scala has some few good libraries and things like that. You, know, you can take the Java NLP libraries. It has a few good statistical libraries, but Python has much better libraries. So often what we did was we would do some example stuff. We would test some stuff out on Python and then kind of port it over to Scala. Isn't always the best. I would love to just do things in Python. The last year I've been looking into kind of PyMC3 and that whole framework, which uses the latest and greatest MC CMC method. It uses like nuts, no U-turn, and you could build really great Bayesian models from first principles. I haven't had enough of a chance to use it kind of in practice yet, but that's sort of what I'm looking at. Sometimes you just have to go with what works. If the best way to productionize something and have it run every day at the company is to do it in Scala, that's kind of what I had to do. Oh yeah, of course. In the end, uh, your programming language is a tool uh, to build something. Yeah. One of the coolest models I've built here, I think, is the sentiment analysis model, which is now like, you know, five years older. But uh, what it does is it takes these four square tips, which are like two or three sentences that people leave at different venues, restaurants, parks, whatever. And we're trying to figure out whether they're positive or negative. And the solution that we came upon was to note that, okay, people are also leaving these explicit ratings like like, dislike, or meh. There's like one of three that you can leave. And some people left one of those explicit ratings ratings and also left a tip. So I kind of felt, okay, well, that is a labeled example. Yes, there's no law of the universe that says that if you can't like a place, but then write negative text about it. But I think that by and large, you know, people are going to write negative text and leave a negative explicit review and write positive text and do positive explicit review. So I built elastic net logistic regression on the phrases that people used up to four words, one, two, three, and four words. And you ran it on that data and it came out with a really good model for predicting whether someone likes or dislikes a place based on the text that they wrote. And what's great about that model, because of the nature of the data sets that we got, is it worked in like 20 languages. Actually, We actually build the model in 97 languages. Most of those don't have enough data for the model to be very good, but even like 20 world languages where the model works great was like pretty awesome. And then every time I see someone with another language, like I pull up the model or someone who knows one of the languages, I pull up the model and I can say, here are the top 10 positive phrases. Here are the bottom 10 positive phrases. I don't really understand what I'm looking at, like maybe it's Russian or something. And then they'll look at that. They'll be like, oh my God, that's totally right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's great. Yeah, yeah. We learn to curse in all these different languages when you train it on the people who have flagged things as offensive. Awesome. Is that available somewhere on open source or is it still a proprietary? Actually, it is. The Python code that I wrote to train that is on my GitHub at like maxsklar slash bayespy, and you can link to it, although it's multi-logistic regression. So the code itself, you can do multiple classes. So it's not just binary classification, because in our case, there was a like, there was a dislike, and there was like a meh, there was a mixed review. We call it meh, M-E-H, but it was sort of a mixed review. And so the solution is kind of built for that. At this point, there have got to be better tools in Python to do it. But Hey, it's there. I kind of wrote it in Cython a little bit, which kind of compiles part of it down to C. And so we got it to run pretty fast. So yeah, if anyone wants to use it, they're welcome to use it. Yeah, of course. Hey, it can be useful like to read, to parse, and even to build on it. So I definitely link to it in the show notes. Sure. Yeah. Now I'd like to turn to your uh, teaching experience because uh, this summer you gave a class in Crane about uh, Bayesian inference and I guess you used PyMC in this course. Actually, my audience by now knows PyMC because I've got uh, I've had a bunch of core developers on the show. Listeners will guess I really love this tool. And so I was interested in your class and I was wondering what were the main skills that you wanted your students to pick up? Yeah, so it was a three-day class and I had three hours each of the three days. So that was nine hours of doing the class. And when I was on the plane right over, I'm like, oh my God, nine hours, how am I going to fill that up? But it turns out every day I had like an extra several hours of stuff I wanted to fit in. But I really broke it down into three days. The first day was more like theory, history, and foundation. I think the first day people really liked. They really liked hearing about Thomas Bayes. They really liked hearing about the code breaking during World War II. They liked hearing about some of the uses that people came up with afterwards, the kind of Bayesian versus frequentist debates. And then up till now, and sort of getting like a grounding of where all this stuff comes from, and then getting like an 
intuition for how Bayes rule works. And then the second day, I went into a more mathematical mode where I went into conjugate priors and all the calculus. And I think that uh, transition was very jarring for people. I think people were like, oh my God, wait a minute. I didn't know there's going to be this much math. And then the third day was a little bit more practical. I talked a little bit about Pi MC3, but again, like I'm no expert in it. So I was just giving a few simple examples, maybe how some of the things where I talk a little bit more about how priors worked. I went into some of the projects that I had done in the past. And so that's sort of how it worked out. I got a lot of teaching it. I got some pretty good feedback from the students. It was really hard though to figure out because going to another country that I had never been to before and trying to figure out what people are going to relate to and uh, not even knowing like what different levels people are going to be at, that was a little difficult. So I think I did <laughs> as well as possible given the circumstances. I was just happy they were like, oh, most of them were like having a good time in the class. What were your objectives? You know, what did you want them to remember at the end of the class? I think I titled the class Bayesian thinking because I wanted them to remember when you have a difficult statistical problem or a difficult decision problem, how to like take a deep breath and to put it into the Bayesian framework so that you have a good starting point from which to tackle this problem. And then to have kind of a good background in terms of the history, the philosophy, and some of the practical practice to actually execute on this. I guess that's a nice skill to have. <laughs> yeah. I actually think I had a slide at the beginning as to like, what are you going to get out of this class? Let me see if I could pull that up real quick. Ah, goals for this course. Now I'm going to see what I wrote down. Be able to understand, mediate, and when necessary, adjudicate disagreements between people when it comes to interpreting the meaning of probabilities, data, and models. Understanding the Bayesian framework for solving problems and its limitations. Be fluent in the nature of probability and uncertainty. Be fluent in Bayes rule and Bayesian thinking as applied to machine learning. And understand the significance and meaning of Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And then a few other things. So yeah, I think it's about right. I could actually link you to the slides for that course if you want to include that in show notes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For people that would be interested, I think that's... Um... That would be great. It was really written for me as I was going through the course to sort of jog my memory on what I'm supposed to be talking about at each stage. But I think the notes can be a little helpful too. Yeah, yeah exactly. Actually, do you think that you achieved these goals? Do you think that the students remember that uh, going out of the class? And I mean, I, I hope so. They said they do, but uh, <laughs> I haven't been able to follow up with them. Are there some things that you think you would do differently the next time you try to teach Bayesian inference? Yeah, I would work on my scoping a little bit. I kind of got in and I was like, oh, I learned all this really cool stuff in the last 10 years. Let me kind of throw it at people. And it's like, well, no, you actually have to kind of edit it down and figure out, you know, which stuff we can kind of skip for this class and which stuff we can focus on more. Yeah, yeah. Just let me summarize what I did for the last 10 years in 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay to just certain things just do don't even include it's that's perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah. Actually, did you notice that some concepts were particularly difficult to impart to your students? Yeah, I think the first part where I had to kind of go over it a second time and people started asking a lot of questions, the first part where I switched to a mathematical mode, which was uh, conjugate priors. Conjugate priors is something that really, I guess, blew my mind in 2010 and 2011. And to me, kind of a triumph of Bayesian inference and something that you could use even before you do sophisticated machine learning algorithms. And it's amazing like how well the math works out in those. I'm talking about kind of the Dirichlet district distribution, the um, beta distribution, the gamma distribution, how you can update those distributions given more data. And then the, the result is another form of that distribution. And it's just a really good way to think about Bayesian inference. But when people sort of sit down and do the math, that's kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around sometimes. Yeah, you're right. That Maybe we could uh, explain that a little just uh, quickly for listeners, but I think I'm not sure, but if I think on the top of my head, like an example of conjugate priors would be, well, if you have a beta prior and a binomial likelihood, then your posterior distribution will be beta distribution too. And so you actually, in, in these cases, you don't need uh, MCMC to do the inference. You can do that by pen and paper. Right, right. And this is you know related to Bayes 
initial problem. And it's just basically like a simple probability problem. Let's say you have a deck of cards and you have red cards and black cards, and you want to know what the proportion is of each. And you have some prior over what that proportion might be. Let's say it's uniform. Let's say it could be somewhere between zero and one. Actually, usually it's the coin example, right? You're flipping a coin and it's some weighted coin and the probability is between zero and one. A uniform distribution between zero and one is a form of the beta distribution. And every time you flip the coin, you just update the beta distribution, you, there's two parameters. And if it's tails, you add one to one parameter. If it's heads, you add one to another parameter. It's that nice. <laughs> it's literally just the two parameters are just counts as to heads and tails with some starting point. And that starting point represents your prior. It's so nice, but it's hard to explain. It's hard to wrap your head around it. I feel like if I were to teach it properly, I would have to have a lot more maybe visual aids and maybe just kind of starting that from scratch. Like, let's just do the one flip problem. The one flip problem is an interesting problem that I give sometimes, which is just 50-50. I have either a coin that is fair or I have a coin that's double-sided heads. And I don't know which one I have. I flip it once and it lands on heads. What's the resulting distribution? I'll leave that answer open to your listeners to think about, but that's a pretty simple one to get in terms of Bayes' rule. And then if you kind of work from there and then back out to kind of a continuous case, then you can start talking about the beta distribution. But working on that discrete problem is tough enough sometimes. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Particularly for beginners. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, Max, our time is almost up. I could ask you a lot more questions, but uh, I think... Uh, okay, we, well, we'll do we, this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. My pleasure. I think it would be interesting to turn to the future now. Okay. I'm wondering, what are your projects for the coming month? Is there something in particular you want to learn or implement? It can be a Bayesian project or it can be something else totally. Well, we have an exciting project coming out in the Foursquare Innovation Lab, and I'm not sure how much I should reveal about this, but in Foursquare fashion, you know, it's, it is a location tech company. It's a consumer app, kind of an experimental app, like, you know, MarsBot is something that I built here in 2016, where you stop at different places and then it sends you text messages telling you, you know, what to order at that place, where to go next, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're kind of expanding that to work in the audio field, which I love because of, you know, the podcasting background. But the idea is your headphones are going to be on all the time. Your AirPods or whatever are going to be on all the time. What does that look like? What does an app look like that kind of lives in the AirPods or lives in the headphones or lives in your ear, essentially? And so we're building something, talks to you as you walk around the city and points out interesting things you might be passing by. Kind of figuring out what the first version of that is, is going to be interesting. So it's not going to be heavily Bayesian. It's going to be more like just intuition. Let's try to build something that I would like to use or that I would find interesting. And then we're going to get feedback and see what happens. Yeah, that's interesting. That actually reminds me of a movie, I think, that uh, was released in 2013 with uh, Jack in Phoenix. Uh, the movie is called The uh, Her. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Her. Actually, Dennis Crowley, who I'm working on with this, he's the founder of Foursquare. That's like one of his favorite movies. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Basically, we're just building a version of that, except not nearly as smart, but it's going to be very smart in terms of knowing you know, what you're passing by. I'm still up in the air. Like, I, I think maybe I can hook it up to a data set from like the History Channel or something that will give you a history of different places in New York City, something like that. There are all sorts of things we can do. And then, of course, there's Foursquare's intelligence in terms of which places are the best which places are not, you know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that looks promising. Good luck uh, on that. Yeah, well, my dream on that is to ultimately come up with like the location-based podcast where we can put some tags in our RSS feed to say like, hey, this audio clip plays when the person passes this place. And uh, <laughs> I don't know, I think uh, just putting that out there, people would do some interesting things with it. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Okay, Max. So now is the time I'm going to ask you the two questions before okay. I, I let you go. That's uh, two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. Okay. So the first one is, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I would go with uh, general AI. I just think that so many problems kind of boil down to how do you build a program that continues to learn, continues to generalize information and can sort of give good recommendations. I mean, that's the basis for something that I could give you like two sub problems of that that I would like to work on. I mean, first is just your day to day, just taking all the data that you and I generate in our day to day lives where we go, what we do, what we eat, and to give you like concrete recommendations, not like what all the apps do now, which are 
kind of based on simpler statistical models and also like just, you know, human curated models, but actually to say, okay, I've used Bayes rule and I've used a bunch of generalized deep algorithms. And I found that when you start doing these things, your life gets better. But when you start doing these other things, your life gets worse. And then I think another application would be of general AI, which we're not too close to, by the way. But I think we'll get to a spot where we'll start to see some of these applications, which is just a machine that could do science and, you know, start actually saying, hey, these causal models make sense. These causal models don't make sense. These are the experiments we should run to try to determine what's true and what's not true in the scientific fields. I mean, one of the big problems today in science is this, this crisis of reproducibility. A lot of the articles we see of scientists discover this, not this. Some of them are true and some of them are not. Sort of something that's going to run and have kind of a good understanding of what's going on by that. Not the same understanding that you and I have, but like a good model of the world and and uh, what different objects in the world are and how they relate to each other. And then to just say, okay, I can instantaneously look at an article or scientific results and figure out what questions to ask, what's likely and what's not, uh, who we can listen to and who can't. I think that's something that is needed, but it's not something that is on the horizon currently. Uh, these are very tough problems. I think in the shorter term, a lot of these are just going to be solved by teaching people more logical thinking and that sort of thing. That's an ambitious answer. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you, it says unlimited time and resources. Oh, so. yeah, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> exactly the goal of the question. Yeah, yeah. And the second question is, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, how would it be? Hmm. So I thought about this one. And the caveat to my answer is for a lot of these people, I don't know how coherent they are. I don't speak the same language or I don't know if they would be good at explaining or interested in explaining their stuff to me. So I have an answer for you. But before I give my answer, I would say I would like to do more research on who's actually someone who uh, is good at giving you the best insights into what they do and how it relates to what you do in like an hour, because that's different from how good of a scientific mind they are. And so the person that came to mind to me is also known as being a little bit strange. So that could affect the outcome of the meeting. A couple episodes ago on the podcast, I believe it was episode 94, I was talking about the nature of infinity. And I wasn't so much talking about infinite sets there. I was more talking about infinite ratios, division by zero, but infinite sets and infinite processes and all that is just a really interesting philosophical and mathematical problem to me. And so the person who I would like to talk to about that is uh, Georg Cantor. He's a 19th century mathematician who was talking about infinite sets, different levels of infinity before that was sort of a common thing to talk about in the mathematical realm. And I think that that would be a fascinating person to talk to. Oh, yeah, I guess. Awesome. That looks really interesting. If you ever have this dinner uh, and you have a, a free spot, uh, yeah, you can think about me. Yeah, yeah. I'll just ask him, what's the highest ordinal number you've counted to? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, more like why was he tackling these problems and what was sort of mind-bending to him? Because I think one of the common ones, and we don't have time to get into it now, is the fact that like, well, real numbers and counting numbers are a different order of infinity. There are more real numbers than there are counting numbers. And trying to understand how deeply, because these people thought about this stuff really deeply and came to a lot of dead ends. And I would love to hear about some of that. Well, Max, thanks a lot. It was great talking with you. I know most listeners already are into Bayesian thinking, but I hope those with a software engineering background will be inspired by your story. Maybe they'll like, try out the awesome Bayesian tools we mentioned. And I encourage people to check out your podcast. It is diverse, it is interesting, and I look forward to it every week. Thanks again, Max, for taking the time and being on this show. Thanks. It's been a fun hour and uh, congrats on starting the podcast. I know how hard it is to start and you've been doing a great job. I look forward to many more episodes. Thanks. Thanks. See you. See ya. This has been another episode of Learning Bayesian Statistics. Be sure to rate, review and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher and visit learnbayesstats.anvil.app for more resources based on today's topics as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true Bayesian state of mind. That's learnbayesstats.anvil.app Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Baba Brinkman fit MC Lars and Megara. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. 
I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. Thanks so much for listening. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. It was-